Well, welcome, Adrian Plass, visiting Thank you very Australia. Much. Thank and you. Uh, good to have you here again. It's not your first visit, is it? Far from it, no. I think we've been here about eight or nine times. Yes. For various tours. Actually, this area, the one we're in now, is leafier and lovelier than anything we've seen in Australia. We've been up to see the, the, uh, the, the blue mount, top of the Blue Mountains, and we were absolutely gobsmacked, to use a theological expression, uh, by, by the, the vista. Causes me to wonder, uh, since I read about your last visit to Perth, will I identify myself in one of your future books, for example? Do you know, this is one of the things that begins to really annoy me. <laughs> people, people come out to me everywhere and say, I was going to say this, but I don't want to be in your next book. I mean, if you are, you will be disguised. You will, I will give you a scar on your left cheek and a slight limp, limp in your right leg. And then whatever you said won't oh, okay. be totally So uh, now, thank you, I'll be able to identify myself totally. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for when that. When I first started writing, we, I had a character, characters called the Flush Pool. Yes, indeed. Who uh, were r rather unpleasant. They went around trying yes. to repair people's positions. Stenneth and Victoria. You, mm. you well, memory is phenomenal. Well, yes, yeah, Stenneth and Victoria. And people were in our hometown kept coming up to me in the supermarket and saying, we know who the flush pools are. <laughs> and I'd always say, no, 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 you don't, but they did. Uh, so, yeah. Speaking of the flush pools, uh, it's interesting that I, uh, there are some of your more memorable characters, but do you actually get opposition from churches? I, we, we generally know your approach. It is, a, it is a sort of fairly humorous and yet underlying a serious approach to Christian life and so mm. on. Do you encounter many of the Victoria flush pools in churches who will look at you sternly and say, yeah, you are on the wrong track here, Mr. Plass? Very few, you? for the reason we were just discussing, I think. That their, their fear is that what they say will be turned into something else. What you do get is a particular kind of very stubborn Christian. I remember going to St Andrews in uh, Scotland to preach at the chapel there, which is a wonderful place, next to the, the famous golf course. Yes. And just before I went in, a lady dressed entirely in wool, which is always a worry, from head to foot, came up to me and said, do you believe Jesus Christ is your Lord and Saviour? I said, uh, yes, I do, yeah. She said, only he can, he can come into your life and change your life, you know. I said, yeah, actually, I've just... She said, if you want to ask him into your life now, it's very easy. I said, look, I'm... I'm spe she said, only I've got a Bible here. If you'd like to... After, I said, look, I'm speaking. I'm, I've got to go in. So I go in very uptight having had this encounter. And as I walked in, a lady from the congregation walked down the steps, gave me a little slip of paper folded, and I unfolded it and it said, thank you for everything. And it was like a little gift from God, you know, just saying, cool, chill, it, chill, chill, chill. So I find that blind, um, non, non um, engaging type of outreach very, very difficult. Uh, it's, it's as though people have an itch that will never be scratched sufficiently for them. You, you do speak in some of your books about uh, the, uh, uh, the different types of Christian outreach and, yeah. the, and, and different concepts of Christian witness. Mm. And uh, I think it was in one of your books, I forget which one it was, but uh, you, you, in, you habituate pu pubs, apparently. And, um, I do and habituate pubs. Pubs, that's yes. wonderful. And uh, English pubs are one, pubs. wonderful places to live. Yeah. Uh, but... You were once described by the bartender, I think, or the publican as, uh, um, you know, there's a religious man in the corner. Oh, that was uh, horrible. Yeah, yes, I've forgotten yes. that. Yeah, yes. there were two elderly gentlemen who obviously drank too much. Yes. In England, we sometimes have a little bar called the Snug, mm. which is a little quiet bar. And they were, they were shouting and swearing. And I was on a little TV program called Company at the time. So I was publicly recognisable as a Christian. And the landlord came through and said, out, you two, out. There's a religious gentleman over there in the corner. And I, I could have died. I just wish I could have died. <laughs> I wanted to say, I'm not a religious gentleman. I'm not religious. I'm not a gentleman. And I don't want them kicked out because I'm here. It's like anti-gospel, really. It, when we look at, obviously, we do want to be Christian witnesses. We are to be yeah. salt and light to the world and so on. And you've, you've mm. talked about the dangers of simplistic outreach. What do you think is the key to any Christian who might be looking at this interview thinking, I really do want to be a witness for Christ, but I, I just don't want to go down that stereotype sort of path? I, I think it's very hard because everyone is so different. I mean, where we've worked over the last few years, Scargo House in Yorkshire, we have a, a group of pastoral workers, people who 
um, volunteers or, or residents, community members, uh, who are on the pastoral team. And they're so different. One, for instance, mentioned by somebody in Australia here this week, which was lovely to hear about him, a chap called Jeff, a very gentle man who would never push anything. And we love to have him. And then we have others who are, who are more uh, proactive with people. When so there are a lot of differences. All, all I would say is, for Bridget and I, over the last 30 years, two things seem to have either brought people back to a, a faith in Christ or nudged them nearer to it. One is vulnerability. There is a sense in which people feel Christian speakers only had problems in the past, which is really ridiculous. Um, but, but to join them in the ditch, one foot on the bank, one foot in the ditch, so they feel safe, um, that vulnerability and uh, I think the awareness of two great truths. One is the truth that about us, which is flawed and funny, tragic, all sorts of things. And the other is the truth about God. The problem for Christian speakers is, is if you stand up and you try to match your message, it's just fake. So uh, I, I think being who you are, being truth, telling the truth, once the truth creeps into the church, you've always got a bit of a problem, haven't you? T telling, the, telling the truth, and perhaps above anything else, being kind. Be kind to people. This comes across in a lot of your writing, and uh, even this, this, uh, this emphasis on kindness within the church, mm -hmm. you, you, you have that also in your view of God. Mm -hmm. I, I might be unfairly paraphrasing you, but in one of your um, books, um, it is God who is, is God is nice and, and, and he likes you. It's that sort of thing, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, I, I had a stress illness 30 odd years ago. Don't get too sad. I've been living off it ever since. <laughs> but uh, it, it was horrible, of course. And I spent a lot of time in our upstairs sitting room. Uh, at that time of the year, the Japanese flowering cherry was out. It was just a cloud of pink. It was truly wonderful. And I led a very simple life. I, I said a couple of prayers from the Anglican prayer book because mm. I didn't have the freedom to, to mm. say any others. Mm. I listened to some music. Mm. Um, I bought a bike and I rode the bike around the village where we lived. And I think I learned what it was like to have God sitting on the front step or the back step with you cycling in a circle in front of him. Mm. No need for conversation, just a relearning of the fact, it is precisely what you said, that God is very nice and he likes me. I mean, who wants to be loved despite everything? That's not much fun, is it? You know, God holds his nose while he ushers you in, doesn't appeal to me at all. Yes, it's sort of a graceless view of grace, isn't it? It is. It like that. I'm glad I thought of that. Yes, it's, it's a graceless <laughs> yes. view of grace. Yes. Use it in your next book, please. Yeah, I absolutely will, yes. And, and some people in public have actually said to me, don't you think that's a very weak word mm. to use about God, that he's nice? And I have always said, you, you may see it like that, and I understand what you're saying, but actually in the church we major on saying God is awesome and wonderful and great, and we don't know what we're talking about really. And the, the God who became man, the father who runs down the road to throw his arms around this oik of a boy who's just decided, because he's hungry, that's what the Bible says, wants some food. Uh, that, that God is the one we are allowed to know. And there are so many barriers put up to us meeting that God by people who are frightened, perhaps that there is no God. There's a, there's a dimension of a plain unbelief that I think prevents We've heard a lot about churches over the last couple of weeks that have got things really sorted, but they don't want it touched by anything from outside. Yes, it's as, as if Christianity can be compressed into a, a set of beliefs and so on, and uh, any ambiguities, any mysteries are sort of a, are a threat to us. Absolutely, and one of the things yeah. that comes out in your writing, it seems, obviously you've got your own theological foundations, but uh, what comes across is that... that there's a whole lot of messiness in life and a whole lot of mystery in life. Oh, it's, it is a mess and there are times and people who are watching this will know this in their hearts when everything that happens to you looks random and other people are saying, well, God is here. 
when you look back and all these other little sound bites that people use. But I mean, our very close friend in London last year died after long chemotherapy and stuff and a great man, a wonderful asset to the kingdom and to the church. Mm. And we all pray and he died and other people live and there is no way of understanding all that. There's no way of understanding why I've been ill for four weeks while I've been in Australia. Um, but I don't, to be, to be fair to myself, um, over these four weeks, I have never s thought or said to God, why are you doing this? I have said several times, look, doesn't this make sense? You know, I'm, I'm here to talk, right? And I can't do it properly. You've got all the power. I haven't got any. What do you think? But like all, every day is a succession of little Gethsemanes, isn't it? Where you say, I would like this, but fair enough. I think the Gethsemane model of prayer is a good one. On the one hand, we put all our desires to God. May this cup pass from me, as it yeah, happened in Gethsemane. Yeah, but yeah. at the same time, bottom line, your will, your um, will, be, done, your yeah. will be done. So much I would think of your writing and your thinking uh, that you've just summarised there has come out of your own personal struggles, hasn't it? They're, of course, they're, yeah. they're, your, your personal life has not been compartmentalised or quarantined from your, no. your public ministry. No, and uh, I think it's a, it, that's quite a... I'm beginning to sound like a really pompous git sitting here. I mean, I, I, the, but you're right, these views have, a, have arisen out of what actually happens to us. I think the best protection you can have as a, a Christian minister, especially travelling... Christian speaker, is to just be who you are. And I know sometimes that's a little bit disappointing for people because they have a, I, I think people like God with skin on and sometimes the speakers and the people who do that stuff yeah. perhaps fill that role for them. Mm. Actually, you know, if the gospels arise and if Jesus was telling the truth, which he may well have been doing, um, we can do nothing. But believe that if we are followers, faithful followers, he can do everything. And that, I still find that exciting. There, there are a number of Christians I know in churches that are hanging on by their fingernails, as yeah, it were, not just yeah. to the church, but to faith as mm -hmm. a whole. And my own understanding is that they think that there's somehow out of their faith is terribly deficient or God's gone terribly wrong because mm. they haven't got all the answers because they're not sort yeah. of living on this constant victorious plane. <laughs> yes. And I think your writing and speaking and your general attitude, I think, addresses that. What more could you say to someone perhaps who was looking at this saying, I'm just hanging in there by my fingertips. I'm mm. about to give up on the church, on faith. Yeah. What can you say to them? Well, actually, Bridget, and my, my wife Bridget and I meet many of these people because at Scargill we pray with lots and lots of people. And one of the great things about that environment is that it has become a safe place to say dangerous things, which is rare. So, and people are often very disappointed with God, with the church, with themselves. And when you, when you poke down into the very heart, the very center of what's going on in them, usually it's the same question does God love me? Does God love me? And you can't take the answer that out of your pocket and give it to them. But you can love them. Another thing we do remind each other about is that people need the food, not the recipe. Mm. So I mean, it's like inviting people to dinner and you say, right, time to eat. You sit down, there's a recipe in each place and they all sit down <laughs> and say, well, where's the food? And you say, well, these are excellent recipes. Take them home. Do them. Um, a lot of people need long-term love and support when they're in that situation. And, and as Paul says in, in one translation of a verse, the origin of which I can't remember, uh, make real friends of the poor. If you're going to minister to someone, if you're going to help them, don't look for an answer. Look for them. Look for who they are. Look for what's happening in their hearts and try and help that. Um, that's what we try to do. We so you're a companion on the journey. You're not saying this is the answer. Not but... at all. No, mm. no. I mean, sometimes you get wonderful things happen. I mean, we, sometimes it's like, you know, the old Christian paperbacks. It's wonderful when it's like that. Uh, we had a lady came in once and she said to Bridget and I, I just want a friend. That's all I want. I want a friend. So we prayed for a friend. It was very simple. She walked out the door and a man came out with a little folded piece of paper on the paper it said, will you be my friend? 
and they married a year after that, which was absolutely wonderful. And those things do happen, but also we have people who are totally devastated. And we had someone recently who um, I just felt so, both of us felt totally lost. Nothing to say to her. We were, we were barren of anything. And I found her afterwards and I said, I just want to tell you that when we were praying, I was in despair for you and for me and for the universe. And she said, oh, thank you. I said, what? She said, thank you for being in it with me and telling me that because so many people are trying to change things for me. She wants change. But sometimes you've just got to be with people in yes. it. And so your ministry is helping people live with the questions rather than providing the answers? I think a lot of it is, yeah. And it's, it's quite frustrating because in the old days we would have hunted for an answer to, to problems like that. Over the years you acquire uh, some insights into people. So people say it's the Holy Spirit. Maybe it is. Maybe it's the fact that you know people enough to be able to see certain things sometimes. But occasionally... It does seem the Holy Spirit does speak into these things. And when that happens, it's, it's uh, quite alarming and uh, exciting and quite funny sometimes. Given all the seriousness that you've just touched on there in, in your own life and also in other Christians' life, did your sort of particular sense of humour just, as it were, come naturally? Or did you feel as though you had to cultivate that in order to combat these darker oh, issues? Oh, no. I, I wrote The Sacred Diary because I was, I was in the middle of a stress illness. I have no concept whatsoever of ministry. Um, I just wrote it. And it was, it was di you know, years of dirty water off my chest. That's why I wrote it. And I assume God said, well, this could be useful. Um, but nothing, it, that was nothing to do with me. The humour comes from... Uh, well, I suppose if I'm honest, I mean, I look back and I see this little boy, me, standing in his sitting room, listening to his mum and dad arguing yet again, and wondering which side to take, and finally one of them saying, Adrian was with me, you saw, didn't you? And me thinking, well, I do, do I lie and say, or do I, what, what do I do? And so I acquired the habit of watching people constantly to see uh, how I could help mm. and I think that that has fed into the, the humour in a way but for a long time I was very sarcastic and very really unpleasant with my humour and as my wife would say um, God took it and turned it into his own and, mm. and I would advise people uh, if you've got a nice juicy bad temper for instance don't get rid of it give it to God he can use it if you have some other wonderful sin, sins are jolly useful. You know, if you, if you say to God, I really don't want to be like this, but can you use it? And he'll say, yes, I think I can, but only if I'm allowed to be in charge of it. Yes. So instead of fighting your temperament, your background, your life issues and so on, you yeah. said to God, well, here you are, it's all there. Please channel it, as it were. Because yeah. I've noticed in your humorous books, <clears throat> well, they are very humorous, um, you're not actually telling jokes. It no. is an interesting humour because your humour, the things that I laugh at in the books, are often just sheer perceptive observations of people where the humour comes from my looking at it and many of your other readers looking at it saying, ah, I can identify with that, yeah. or that person reminds me of so-and-so. I, I think it is about seeing things that we all see and being able to, to say them. I mean, which is a lot of humour is based on that, isn't it? But, I mean... Humour gets into your bones. I dreamt, dreamt a joke once. I was in the middle of uh, writing a book and I was trying to think of funny things all day, you know, which, is, which is, can be awful. And I dreamt a joke. I, I dreamt there was a bonfire, right? And I was in charge of keeping it alight. So I put all the coal on, all the wood on, and now there was none left. And I was going to throw myself on in the dream. And a woman shouted at me, don't be a fuel. <laughs> well, I mean, it's a terrible joke, but I dreamt it. You My dreamt. <laughs> subconscious said, I've got to make a joke here. And uh, so I used it, of course, <laughs> next day, put it in a book. Yes, I, I think an uh, example, of, uh, like in your sacred diaries and so on, you, you, you're trying to move a paper clip through 
some faith. sort of by yeah. faith and then yeah. hoping a Japanese admiral in a, of a midget submarine or something turns up at the door. I mean, these are examples to me of almost like exaggerating what mm -hmm. we Christians actually might privately believe or practice. Well, in the 80s, it was hardly exaggerating, I have to be honest. I mean, there's a little bit in the diary about a, a, a Californian who comes to talk about the gifts. Would be a Californian, wouldn't it, I suppose? And uh, he says, we can all practice word of knowledge right now. And this is a true story. So this young man stands up later on and says, points at this girl and says, you've got a pain in your lower abdomen. And she says she hasn't. And he says she has. And she says she hasn't. And he says she has because the Lord told him. And maybe she hasn't got the faith to feel it. <laughs> Which is so utterly ludicrous. But... The, there's something for, for Christians in the mid 80s and the 90s to suddenly see the sacred cows, not just shot, but dead, some of them, lifting your hands in the air. There's nothing sacred about that. Using a funny, soupy voice, which is one of the killers, you know, it's one of the ways people are held down. Um, all of these things were oppressing people, not maliciously, but because people are frightened that if they set people free, they'll, they'll mm. take a freedom that is, that is bad for them. Or uh, and, and maybe that's the reason, is it, that some people are disenchanted with church, with faith, because they're, they're still attached to some of those images, to some of those um, expectations and so on? Well, some, but some, some are there because of them. Mm. That, um, we did a weekend called A Hunger to Belong. And my goodness, the, the pungency of that need to belong to something. Mm. And I mean, we know churches all over the place that where people just love the fact that the minister knows what's what. He knows what you should do, what you should think, where you should go, how you should feel. Um, and I, I suppose a lot of people are longing for it to be real, to discover God actually turns up. I mean, I mentioned the prodigal father, uh, the prodigal son's father. And in theory, we are to expect an incredible encounter with God. Parties, fatty calves, all the rest of it. And in your heart, the knowledge that you're forgiven, that everything's all right. You know that wonderful idea, it's okay, it's all right. Where is it? Where is it? And what, do you, what is the answer there? I mean, I, I myself in the ministry have met with people who have... Um, more or less felt that every Sunday they've come out of church feeling lashed again mm. by guilt lashed and again. so on. Well, I, I, yes. I, I'm, I'm meant to feel guilty, so I do feel guilty and so yes, on. And, yeah. and uh, um, what do you think is the remedy for, or is there a remedy for that sort of thing that people go into church and have this mm. life encounter, this, this life changing encounter with God? It's not an easy question to answer, but one of the the things people have to do is to trust their own passions sometimes, I think. I'll give you an example. A lady knocked on our door one day, not long ago, and she, we met her in Tesco's, don't know how, but in Tesco's, and said we lived down the road. So she came and knocked on the door. And she said, I, I want to ask you what to do. Um, she said, I, my son lives in Australia and he's gay and he's going to get married and I want to go to his wedding. And the people in my church say I can't go because I will be tacitly approving of the gay lifestyle. Leave aside all the issues there, but she said, but I want to go, I love him, I love him. And she's a new member of the church. So obviously she thinks this can't be right. These people are experienced people. They're actually, um, I think, surviving like people are in a garrison instead of a home. Uh, and you're not supposed to advise people directly, are you? But I actually said to her, if you don't go, Jesus isn't going, so you go. And she rang up her, su her son and actually got his, the man, his partner on the phone and he burst into tears and he said, it's so wonderful that you're going to come even though you disapprove of our relationship it means so much to me so that that impulse in her to do the loving thing that God has put in her is very dependable 
But when you've got a little Greek chorus of people who have views on every single damn thing telling you what you can and can't do, it's very difficult to do that. So basically we're talking here about another encounter with grace, aren't we? Yeah, the, the undeserved kindness of God. Yeah, we do talk a lot about grace, about the the rocks of the law on one side and the swamp of license on the other. Mm-hmm. And then this wonderful, ingenious little curling path of grace that can do things that you never ever thought of. What's your future direction now? I know, I know life is not carefully mapped out for you, but mm-hmm. do you see yourself and Bridget in your public ministry going in different directions at this stage? Or? I don't know. Yeah. I think it dignifies our lives a bit that we would even think as a, in as ordered a way as that. Uh, we, lo- we enjoy what we do. We love talking to people. We love praying with people particularly. Um, if we can go on doing that, I think we'll be very happy. Um, we've got no, no, pl- no big plans for anything. Um, we'd like to spend more time with our family. We've got four, four grown-up kids. One in Africa, one in America, two in England. We'd like to be with them a lot more. But in terms of ministry, I think we've got one more challenge in us. One more thing. Mm. So if there's anyone out there who thinks they know what it is, let us know. Thanks, Adrian. Appreciate your time. It's a pleasure.